Uh, we've been rolling through uh, the second half here and buffers. And again, uh, we started talking about buffer calculations. Remember, again, you do have uh, two options to do buffer calculations. Once again, you can always ice table pretty much in any situation. That's an equilibrium type situation. You could also, if it is a buffer, uh, you could definitely use your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation as well. And what we talked about sort of last time was uh, the addition of either acid or base to your buffer. And as we talked about last time, when you do basically an addition of any type of volume uh, to another solution, we're really doing a dilution. And how that affects the calculations, as we talked about last time, is uh, we cannot do really the calculations in molarity. Again, because as you change the volume, uh, the molarity of everybody starts to change because the volume of the solution starts to change. What does remain constant, though, is moles, and we can uh, do the ice table in moles. So in a buffer situation where you're adding either acid or base to your buffer, and as we will see shortly here in a titration situation where you're constantly adding volume, uh, we want to do that first ice table in moles. And it's also really important for a lot of calculations that we do in this class after you're sort of done with the first ice table and everybody's in moles. And the idea really of the first ice table in the case of the buffer is to figure out how your buffer changes as a result of you either adding acid or base to it. As we'll talk about with titrations, it's how your titration has changed in terms of pH as you continue to add stuff to it. Um, we wanna also always uh, take these guys after the first ice table and definitely divide by the total volume and convert everybody back to molarity. That's really good practice to do. And as we'll see in some calculations coming up, if you are not in molarity after that first ice table and you continue on to do a calculation and you do it with moles, you will get the wrong answer uh, because you didn't take the volume into account. So it's just really good practice to slap it back into uh, molarity after that first ice table you will probably 99.9 .9 times, even 100 times, uh, be in the correct units that you need for any type of calculation that you're going to continue doing. Now, with that being said, truth be told that if you know it's a buffer and this is technically your final destination here in terms of how you're going to do the calculation, uh, you can go moles on top and moles on the bottom here, and it will work out correctly because the leaders on top and bottom there will cancel out. Uh, so it will actually work out with moles. If you want to go into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation with the moles of your base and the moles of your acid, it will work. If you're going to go into the ice table approach, again, you should be in molarity uh, when you're doing it. So to take that sort of small area where you might make a mistake out of play after you do the first ice table, just convert everybody back to molarity, and then you'll always be in sort of the correct units, no matter sort of what calculation you're going to do next. So it's just really good practice to kind of do it that way. Um, remember that uh, if a buffer is working correctly and we do this calculation correctly, um, after the first ice table, you should still have a buffer left over. And really at that point, again, you could use one of your two options to figure out the pH at that point. Um, <clears throat> you can sort of test yourself in a lot of cases, not 100% of the time, but uh, you know, in most cases, if it is a truly good functioning buffer and you didn't really blow through the buffer in a problem, uh, you should see the pH go either down a little bit if uh, you added acid, the pH should go up a little bit if you added base. Um, if it was a good buffer, you shouldn't see, again, a big giant swing in the pH when you do those things. So most sort of textbook type problems that you do that are buffers, the idea is it's probably a good buffer for that situation. And you can kind of check your calculation. Also, more importantly, in terms of whether or not it, it jumped big or did not jump big, the way you could check your calculation, obviously, is to make sure that you did it in the right direction. So if you added base and you saw that your pH went down after you added the base, then you definitely are going in the wrong direction or vice versa. If you added acid and you see your pH went up, then you're definitely going in the wrong direction. Any questions on that there? All right, so let's take a look at one here. Let's do a couple of things here. Um, 
let's add to this one. Why not? In addition to our, we want to we want to calculate the pH of this buffer that's made up of 0.3 molar ammonia and 0.36 molar ammonium chloride. So we want the uh, pH before we do anything. What is the pH after you add 20 milliliters of 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide to 80 milliliters of this buffer? So we want the pH after we add base. And we're going to add one to here. What is the pH after you add, we'll go with why not, 50 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar hydrochloric acid to the 80 milliliters of the buffer. All right, so three separate questions. What's the pH before? What's the pH, like it says in the question, after we add 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide? And third question there, what is the pH after we add 50 milliliters of 0.2 molar HCl to this original buffer of 80 milliliters? So these are all separate. You're starting with a fresh buffer in each of those cases. Fresh buffer, you add the 20 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide, then you got fresh buffer and you're adding uh, 20, 50 milliliters of the HCl. The, we'll go with, why not, the Kb for NH3, 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. All right, so take some time, see what you come up with here. <clears throat> I'll do that as well, since I made up the last one. We'll hope it works. All right. Don't be wrong once, I suppose. By the way, in this case, we are not keeping the volumes constant. So make sure you take into account the volumes of everybody in this problem, yes. Okay, so let's take a look, see how you're doing here. Um, so we got three questions here. Obviously, we have a buffer. If it did not tell you it was a buffer, uh, you hopefully should recognize that these two guys are basically related to each other. Uh, that obviously is a weak base, which hopefully you know. If not, you could find the KB value for it, which tells you it's a weak base. This guy, again, is the salt of his conjugate acid, NH4 plus and Cl minus, and it really is the NH4 plus there and the NH3, uh, which is his conjugate acid in this case. Also, if you're not sure which one is the acid or base uh, in a combination of a buffer, obviously the one that has one more hydrogen would be your acid because it has to be able to give away the hydrogen. So that's a good way to kind of know that. So since this is a buffer and uh, we're looking first off for what the pH is uh, before we do anything to it, we again do have two options. You could either ice table it up and you actually have two options of how you would want to do the ice table. You could either do a KB type ice table where you would get the OH minus concentration and then convert it to the pH. Uh, you can also do a Ka type ice table using NH4 plus and uh, going that way as well. But probably the easier move is because you do recognize it hopefully as a buffer. Uh, you could just go right into the Henderson Hasselbach equation. And again, uh, in this case, I'm going to use the Henderson Hasselbach equation. I do not have uh, the Ka value given to me, but I do have the PKB value, which again opens up a couple of options for you. We could do like we've done before and get the Ka value by taking Kw divided by Kb, which would give us 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And that's going to get us there a Ka value of call it 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. I then could do my pKa would equal minus the log of the Ka value, uh, which would be minus the log of 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. And that's going to get me 
nine point two five as my PKA bag. That's not a I guess I should have boxes, it's not really a pH or anything like that. Now, if you wanted to as well, you could have uh, took this. And mind you, if you didn't use the rounded number, you would get a 9.26, but uh, for here. You would take um, the PKB if you wanted to, minus the log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, that's going to give us a 4.74 for our PKB value. Remember that the PKA plus the PKB equals 14 which means the PKA would be 14 minus 4.74. In this case, you will get a slightly different answer, 9.26, or you would get the same answer if you didn't round it. But if you did round it, you would get 9.25. So either one would be fine. Again, those would all be our PKA values. I personally can go with the 9.25. That's usually what people use for ammonia as the sort of our ammonium as the pKa value, but 9.26 wouldn't be necessarily wrong um, because you can get obviously a couple of different ways depending on where you round it. Any questions on any of that? The take home message of this is at some point you got to get to pKa if you're using the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So we're going to go into our Henderson Hasselbalch equation at this point. Again, I'm going to use that 9.25 value plus the log of my base over my acid. So again, we want to make sure that the base, which is my ammonia, goes up on top, and my uh, acid there goes on the bottom. And if we do all that good stuff to answer our first question of the day here, we will end up uh, with a opening pH of about 9.17 before we add anything pH. Yeah question on that not to give you too many options but you could have used the poh version of it with the pkb value and then subtract 14 and you get a safe place as well so as you can see there's a few different ways that you could kind of approach some of these uh, sort of calculations any questions on the first one there all right this also illustrates the point that as i mentioned before although you could use that poh version even though it's a basic buffer, the Henderson Hasselbach works perfectly fine. And again, you usually want the pH anyways. So minus we'll just go into that equation and get the pH that you need. All right, we're now going to take this buffer and we're going to add some sodium hydroxide to it in this case. And so we have uh, 0.3 and 0.36. So 0.3 molar NH3. 0.36 molar NH4Cl, and we got a pKa value of 9.25. And in this case, we're going to add some sodium hydroxide, 20 mils of 0.05 molar, 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide to 80 milliliters of our buffer. So just to set up what we got going on, we have our buffer over here, right? And we got 80 milliliters of it. And remember, since it is a buffer, we will have the equilibrium set up by ammonia. And we basically have these guys floating around in there to start with. And <clears throat> we're definitely going to add our sodium hydroxide here, some volume of that. So this tells us we do need an ice table to see how our buffer is going to be affected by the addition of the sodium hydroxide. We also know since we are adding volume here, we got to also do it in moles here, the first uh, reaction. So since sodium hydroxide is a base and our buffer here has a base part and an acid part, hopefully you recognize that it should react with the acid part of the buffer in this case. Um, so we're going to get NH4Cl plus a little sodium hydroxide in this case. We're going to get something here, huh? So we're going to get a little bit of water happening, dare I say. And that's an H plus coming this way, by the way. These guys coming together. That's going to leave us a little NH3 as well. And for good measure, we can't forget about our friend sodium chloride as well. So we will get a little sodium chloride happening there. Although in the case of the calculation, not all important, really. Get rid of my writing there. 
So we'll end up actually with three products as a result of this reaction, a little sodium chloride happening here. Any questions on that? We're going to initially go here, and since we do need to do it in moles, uh, we didn't do a little calculation here. So I got 80 milliliters for my moles of NH4+. Plus. I have 80 milliliters, which I need to convert to liters. I need to times it by the molarity of my NH4+, plus, which is 0.36 moles per liter. And that's going to give me 0 0.08 times 0.36. 0 0.0288 moles of NH4 plus. So we're going to open up here with 0 0.0288 moles of this guy. For my sodium hydroxide, I also need that as well. We're going to do a similar calculation. We're taking 20 milliliters. We need to convert to liters. Move to decimal three places to the left or divide by a thousand to do so. We're going to times it by the molarity of our sodium hydroxide, and that will get us there 0 0.001 moles of sodium hydroxide. So that will be our initial here, 0 0.001. Water, I don't need to worry about, right? What about ammonia? Do we have some ammonia to start with? We do, otherwise it's not a buffer and you're not doing the correct problem. So we do need an initial moles of ammonia here. That also is 80 milliliters converted to moles by times it by the molarity of 0.3 moles per liter. And not divide it, but uh, multiply it. So a concept that sometimes people miss when they're doing this is this part right here. And it is the fact that in your buffer, you have both of those things floating around to begin with, right? Otherwise, it's not a buffer. And they are both sitting in a total volume, in this case, of 80 milliliters. So the 80 milliliters goes for both parts of the buffer because they're in the same beaker that has the same volume. So sometimes people get confused as to, you know, why is it the same volume for both of those guys or they don't have the volume for one of them. Any questions on that there? By the way, am I going to be concerned about sodium chloride? Not really. Again, even though it's part of the reaction, we're not going to worry about because it, it would not affect the pH since it's neutral. Any questions so far on the first part here? All right, so since this is a buffer, we should hope it uses up the sodium hydroxide. And remember, when you kind of do ice tables with moles, typically you will have a number for the change part, not an X. So this is going to be minus 0 0.001. That's also the smaller number, which means it's the limiting reagent in this case, basically. And we'll have minus 0 0.01 and a plus 0 0.001. That means when we reach equilibrium, as I scratch over it all there, uh, we will have 0 0.0288 plus 0 0.001. It's going to give me 0 0.0298 moles. We're going to zero out our sodium hydroxide. Remember, on the right-hand side here, we're actually adding, not subtracting. Another very common mistake. Yeah, So we're going to add that 0 0.025 moles. Any questions on the ice table here? Again, as I mentioned before, pretty good practice after this first ice table. We're going to convert now back into molarity. So we need the total volume, right? So we had 80 milliliters of our buffer. We took 20 milliliters of our sodium hydroxide and put it in. That means that our total volume at this point is 100 milliliters. So that is what we're going to use to convert everybody back into Molarity, so we're going to divide by the total volume, obviously converted to liters. So once again, divide by a thousand or move the decimal place. And that's going to get us here. Yeah. It is uh, 0 0.0288 minus 0 0.001. It is, thank you, it is 278. How's that? That sounds better, I think. Thank you very much. See, don't do what I just did, which I probably added it there to that side there. So make sure you, you subtract it there. The other side, I think, is good, yeah? So there we go.
All right, so uh, that should be point zero two seven eight there. Fix that up there. There we go, two seven eight. So that's going to get us uh, point zero uh, two seven eight divided by point one. Going to give us zero point two seven eight molar. On the other side there, point zero two five divided by point one. Uh, going to give us 0 0.25 molar. Once again, at this point, if you're not sure what's going on, um, you could use your ice table to help you. You have ammonia, you have ammonium chloride. Again, at the end of this ice table, after you reacted the sodium hydroxide, you still have a buffer present which means you could go right into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, or again, you could ice table it up if you wanted to. I'm going to go into the Henderson-Hasselbalch. pH is going to be my pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. That's going to be a 9.25 plus the log of uh, my base, which is over here, 0 0.25 divided by my acid, 0.278. And uh, that's going to get me looks like a 9.20 when I added my sodium hydroxide. Any questions on that right there? Now, does this make sense? Our original buffer before we added the sodium hydroxide had a pH of 9.0. One seven, We added a little bit here of some base, and the pH went in the correct direction. It went up a little bit to 9.2, which is good because we added some base. Not a giant jump in pH, but did go in the correct direction. By the way, that is how when you make a buffer, for example, and you make any way out everything like you're going to do in this next experiment, uh, your pH or your buffer will not be exactly what you calculated it to. So you can use a strong acid or a strong base and dial in your buffer to the correct pH by just adding a little bit and you'll see the pH go up or down depending on which way you want. You could actually dial into exactly the uh, pH that you wanted to make. So because it won't jump big, you could actually use strong acid or strong base to dial in your pH to the exact pH that you need or your buffer to the exact pH that you need. Question on that calculation there. All right, we're going to do then uh, number three I made up there, which in this case to the same buffer here, we're going to add 50 milliliters of 0.2 molar. So 50 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar HCl to our 80 milliliters of uh, was 0 0.3 molar ammonia and 0 0.36 molar ammonium chloride. Again, still the same pKa, 9.25. All right, so in this case, same setup. We're gonna start with a fresh buffer in the beaker. We're gonna to add to this now 50 milliliters of some acid and see what happens. Uh, so again, obviously we're gonna to need to do an ice table and we're going to need to get some moles of everybody. In this case though, since we are adding the acid here, it is going to react with the base in this case. And we will get this reaction here of hydrochloric acid plus ammonia. Again, he's gonna send an H plus over there and that's gonna get us basically uh, ammonium and a little chloride in this particular case. <clears throat> and I'm gonna keep them actually uh, separated uh, since I know only the ammonium is gonna really be affected. If you wanna keep it together as ammonium chloride, you can, uh, but we know chloride is a neutral salt anyways, right? So it's not gonna really do anything. So I'm just gonna split it off. Uh, but if you wanna keep it together as ammonium chloride, you can. Now, in this case, we also need to do it in moles. So once again, we need to do our calculation to get our moles. So we're gonna take basically 50 milliliters converted to liters. So that's 0 0.05 liters times our molarity of 0.2. And that will get us something like 0. Uh, looks like 0 0.01 moles. 
we will have really the same moles we had on the previous page there for our ammonia and ammonium. Uh, we've got uh, 0 0.08, which is our 80 milliliters converted to liters, times 0 0.3 going to give us 0 0.024 moles and an ammonium will have 0 0.08 times 0 0.36 going to give us our same moles we started with on the previous problem as well once again i'm just going to ignore the chloride as it's obviously not going to affect the ph once again here it is going to be our acid in this case that we're adding it's going to be the limiting reagent as a smaller number minus 0 0.01, minus 0 0.01, and a plus 0 0.01. That's going to give us here all of our acid or HCl being used up. 0 0.04 minus 0 0.01 going to get us there. Uh, 0.24, there we go, minus 0 0.01. Uh, it looks like 0 0.014 moles. And we're going to add on the other side there. So uh, 0 0.0288 plus 0 0.01 going to get us uh, 0 0.0 what? 0 0.0388 moles. All right. Uh, let's see. Any questions on the ice table here? So very similar. So obviously we're reacting different things here. We want to react our acid with our base in this case. At this point, we again started with... In terms of our buffer, 80 milliliters. In this case, we actually added 50 milliliters of our acid to it. Uh, so that's going to give us, in this case, a total volume of 130 milliliters, right, is our total volume. That is what we're going to use to convert back to molarity. We're going to divide by 0 0.13 liters. And that's going to give us our molarity here, 0 0.014 divided by 0 0.13, uh, 0 0.10, I'll call it 8 molar, and 0 0.0388 divided by 0.13, 0 0.298 molar. <clears throat> Once again, if you're not sure what you have left over, your ice table can help you. You have this guy left over and you have this guy left over. Hopefully you can still recognize that they are related to each other as still a buffer. So at this point, you can go into your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. We'll use our same pKa value in this case. That's going to be uh, 9.25. Was that pKa? Plus the log of our base, which is uh, right here, over here, 0 0.108, 0 0.298. So if we do all that good stuff there, we hopefully get something here. Let's see here, plus 9.25. It's going to give us an 8.81 pH. Yeah. Questions on that? In this case, I added acid, and we started at 9.17, and we went down to 8.8. .8, so it is moving in the correct direction. We had a little bit more of a jump here because, well, frankly, we started with less moles of the base part of our buffer, and we added a lot more moles of the acid here to this, so we see a little bigger jump, but not a giant jump. It didn't go from 9.17 all the way down to like 2, right? So we didn't have a giant jump to pH, but it did move a little bit more than the last one because of our base part of our buffer here was a little less than our acid part, so it can handle a little less action. Any questions on buffers, how to calculate it? So you obviously need to be able to write these equations. Yes, you need to be able to do these calculations when you add acid or base to a buffer and see how the pH changes. Any questions on buffers? All right, then buffers down. Let's then talk about the next big topic of the season here, which is everybody's favorite thing titrations yes so titrations is the next uh big topic that we're going to talk about uh the good news about titrations is frankly you pretty much have done all the calculations the bad news of titrations is people sometimes don't know which calculation to do when so that is the problem part of this uh titrations but let's talk about titrations. so usually we use titrations uh when we have a solution of no concentration and we typically will either add it to a solution of unknown concentration 
or vice versa. So typically, right, we do a titration. We use a wonderfully drawn burette right about there. It looks like that, I suppose, right? And maybe we put our base up here and our acid on the bottom. You could do it either way. And we continue to add slowly, right, our titrant uh, to our solution there. And we continue to go until we reach what is known as the equivalence point. And the equivalence point in an acid-based titration is the point where exactly the moles of the acid will pretty much equal the moles of the base. So when you hit the equivalence point in a titration, uh, that is pretty much where you're at. You have hit exactly enough moles of acid and base to pretty much neutralize each other. You got nothing left of either one of those guys. That is not to be confused with what is sometimes mentioned as the end point of a titration. The end point of a titration is where you lay up your titration and call it done. And hopefully if you do a good titration, the end point of your titration is usually very, very close, hopefully to the equivalence point. And that's sort of the idea there. So how do you know when you should lay up your titration? Well, you use an indicator and use an acid base indicator, for example, everybody's friends, phenolphthalein, yes. Phenolphthalein uh, is what color in acidic solutions? Colorless, yes. How about neutral solution? Still colorless. Basic solution it is? Pink, yeah, it's probably the indicator you use in all your titrations. Yes, so it is pink. And we're going to talk about, you know, maybe you've done your titrations, right? And you're supposed to titrate until it is the dark pink or light pink. Light is color pink, right? And if you didn't get light pink, did your teacher make you retitrate? Re wow, that's a mean teacher. You didn't really need to do that, probably. That was a waste of time. So uh, we'll talk why that was perhaps a waste of time and why he probably made you do that or she made you do that, depending on what teacher you had. But... Uh, we usually want to go to the lightest color pink. And as we'll talk about how pH indicators work or, or really indicators work is they work over a uh, pH range. Yeah. And for example, phenolphthalein works somewhere like 8.3 to 10 ish. At 8.3, it's colorless. Then it gradually gets everybody's favorite color of pink, dark pink, super fuchsia pink, right? It's all the way down there, depending on where you stop your titration as you get closer to a pH of 10. So we'll explain why, you know, you might not have had to worry too much about that. But ideally, usually they tell you you want the lightest color of pink that you could see because your equivalence point is at this end of the spectrum. And that's colorless, which means the only way you can know to stop is to see the lightest. You got to put a white piece of paper underneath it, right, uh, to see the color pink uh, so that you know that you could stop it. So. We do some titrations. You get this wonderful pink color. That's not bad, actually. And uh, you stop your titration. <clears throat> Doing some type of stoichiometry calculation, right? You could calculate things like the concentration, right, of your unknown acid, for example, or maybe your base as well. You maybe did some standardizing of your base, probably in Chem 50 as well, uh, where you use a known substance like KHP to standardize uh, your base so that you can use it. So we're going to talk about some different types of titrations here. And the first type of titration we're going to talk about is a titration between a strong acid and a strong base, like something like hydrochloric acid and, say, sodium hydroxide. And when that happens, we will get uh, sodium chloride on our double displacement reactions and our water that's being formed here in this case. So just so you got a visual sort of understanding of what's happening here, up in our burette in this titration is your sodium hydroxide. So your sodium hydroxide is up on top. In your beaker, your flask is your HCl. So we're adding our sodium hydroxide to our HCl in this particular case. What we see here on the screen here is a titration curve. 
and a titration curve, I spit that out, is uh, pH there on the Y and the volume of base, for example, in this case, of what you're adding there. And it gives us this typical sort of S-shaped curve is typically where we're at. And when we do a titration, there's really kind of four parts to every titration that you do in a titration curve. The very first part is uh, before you begin. So that's like before you begin the titration, you haven't had any sodium hydroxide happening. That is, you know, what you have going on. You can figure out the pH. The next part of the titration curve is from the very first drop to right before the equivalence point. That is the second part of the titration curve. Then we hit the equivalence point. That is the third part of the titration. And then maybe something you didn't do last semester that we will do this semester, which is titration with no problem because you're gonna go past the equivalence point anyway, so not a big deal. So you're going to keep on titrating past the equivalence point because that super pink color did not stop you. And you said, I'm just gonna keep going. And that would be the fourth part, which is after the equivalence point to get your full sort of titration curve. So we're gonna talk about each of these spots on the titration curve. We're gonna talk about how you get to the pH of your solution along the way when you're doing it. So we're gonna start here with not too bad, the very first part here of this titration curve, which is before we add, in this case, any sodium hydroxide or whatever you're adding in your burette, basically. So before we add anything to my beaker down here, the only thing I have in my beaker in this case is hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, right? Which means if I wanted the pH of my solution before I begin the titration, how do I get the pH of a strong acid? It is going to, we know, 100% break apart into H plus and Cl minus. Which means if I know the molarity of my hydrochloric acid, it is a one-to-one -one relationship, which means I know the molarity of my H plus. And frankly, that's all I need here to figure out what my pH is. I could go right into the pH equation. So in this type of titration, if you're starting with a strong acid in your beaker or your flask, and you're adding some strong base to it, before you start the titration, you could figure out the pH of your solution because frankly, all you have is a beaker of strong acid and that will give you the H plus concentration. No adjustment needed. You can go right into the pH equation and you could have your pH. Any questions on that? Not too bad. Yeah. All right. Now that we know the pH of our original solution, which is good in case our pH meter is broken. We're going to now look at number two here. And number two, we're definitely starting our titration. So we're definitely starting to drop some sodium hydroxide. Now, clearly in a titration, if I start my titration, I continue to drop some sodium hydroxide here. I am definitely adding volume, right? Which means I need to do an ice table here to figure out how my acid is changing. That ice table should be a molarity or moles should be moles, right? Because all you're doing is constantly adding volume. So you do need to do the very first ice table here in moles. It will require at least one ice table here to uh, figure out what is happening to your strong acid. And that does need to be done in moles. So let's say, for example, here at number two, I start to add some sodium hydroxide. And that is going to, and we're obviously before the equivalence point, right? <laughs> so if we add some sodium hydroxide before the equivalence point, I am going to get a reaction. I'm going to get a reaction between my HCl and my sodium hydroxide, right? I'm going to get uh, that same reaction I wrote on the other page, a little sodium chloride and a little bit of water action happening, right? So we do need to do, like I said, an ice table here. This ice table does need to be in moles. So just to demonstrate to you the calculation, and so you can put it in your notes if you like, 
I'm making up these numbers for later watching or whatever it is. I'm just making up these numbers out of my head. That's where these numbers are coming from. So I'm going to say that initially here for my HCL, I'm going to start with four moles. Again, just a made up number. Okay. Now I'm adding some sodium hydroxide here to my four moles of HCL. I am before the equivalence point. Should the moles of sodium hydroxide be less than, equal to, or greater than the moles of the HCL at this point? If you're not sure, what is the moles at the equivalence point of each of those? The moles at the equivalence point, the moles of the acid equals the moles of the base, right? They're equal to each other at the equivalence point, which means I am adding this guy and this is what I'm starting with. So if I'm before the equivalence point, should it be less or more than? It should be less, right? Because equivalence point, they're equal. You're adding. They're not going to get equal until you get there, right? So whatever you're adding has to be less than equal before the equivalence point. So again, making up the number here, I'm going to go with the hard number of two moles. And really, I'm going to go zero there. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Now, at this point, what should be my change? Which one is like the limiting reagent here? It is the smaller number, which is the sodium hydroxide. So I have plenty of HCl to use up that sodium hydroxide at this point. So I'm going to get a change of minus 2 moles, minus 2 moles, and a plus 2 moles. That means when I get to equilibrium here, I will have two moles of this guy, zero of this guy, and two moles of this guy. Just like we did with buffers at the end of this ice table, we're going to convert back into molarity by taking the total volume. The total volume at this point is obviously how much HCl we started with and how much sodium hydroxide we added in, right? So we're just gonna add those numbers together. We do need to convert it to liters, and that would be our total volume at this point in the titration. And that will give us the molarity of this guy. We'll divide by the total volume here, and that will give us the molarity of this guy. At this point, if you're not sure where we can get the pH from, we have this guy left over and this guy left over. Is that a buffer? The answer is no, it is not a buffer. Why is it not a buffer? Even though they are related to each other, why is that not a buffer? That is a strong acid and is conjugate base, right? And you cannot have a buffer that's a strong acid. This is the problem with titrations because you just learned Henderson Hasselbach, which says, I have two numbers. I have two numbers. I'm going to go into the Henderson Hasselbach. And then you get a big X. So you don't want that. Yeah. So even though, again, you have that henderson osbach equation to you. This is not a buffer situation. What you basically have is a salt here, which is what type of salt, by the way? That is a neutral salt, right? Sodium group one, chloride from HCl, not important. This is really the thing that's important at this point in this titration, which is the strong acid. And because that's a strong acid, we know that this basically will be our H plus concentration. And then you could go into the pH equation at that point. So in this type of titration, when you're doing a strong acid and strong base titration, from the very first drop that you put in there of sodium hydroxide or whatever base you're adding, all the way up to the equivalence point, it requires you to do one ice table in moles. The purpose of that ice table is to figure out how much of your strong acid you actually still have left over. And once you figure out the concentration of your strong acid that's left over, you could go into the pH equation and get the pH at that point. Any questions on that there? Yeah. So that takes us to the equivalence point, which is part three. And now the question that you always ask and the answer to the other common thing that you always hear people say when they're doing titrations, and perhaps you heard this when you did titrations before, I only added one drop and the thing went super pink, right? It's like colorless, so I added one drop and the thing went super dark pink, right? 
probably heard people say that. Heck, you might have said it yourself. It's a very common thing people like to say when they're titrating. So why does that happen? It happens because as we approach the equivalence point, for example, what do we see on this graph? Well, if we look at this equivalence point, I'm adding, I'm adding, and all of a sudden here I am shooting up to the equivalence point. And by the way, I'm also shooting up after the equivalence point there. So as I approach the equivalence point, it is, dare I say, pretty vertical, yes? And because it's pretty vertical, the pH changes by a little or a lot? Changes a lot, right? As it's going vertical. What about the volume? Does the volume change a lot? Volume doesn't change very much. If you were there, there, volume changes little. So when you think about your indicator, right, that works from a pH of 8.3 to like 10, where it's colorless here and super dark pink over here. When you add one drop, which isn't a lot of volume, you could find yourself right about there, right? And your indicator is going to now be super dark pink, right? And you're like, shoot, now I got to do it again. And that's what your teacher told you probably. And then you should tell your teacher, no, I don't need to do it again because I'm an experienced titration person and I didn't miss it by that much, right? Is there a very big difference between the volume if I missed it by a drop or two there and the volume at the equivalence point? Those volumes are pretty much the same, which means you did not need to really redo your titration at that point if you were really, really careful. The reason they most likely told you to do it is because if you titrated like I did when I was in school, which was I was the first one done, I opened it up, shut it, it was pink, I went home at that point because <laughs> titration's over. You just said it needed to be pink and it was pink. So I was always the first one done. So they don't know if you did something like that because if I was titrating like I did when I was in school and I was over here, wouldn't my color be dark pink? Definitely would be dark pink, right? Because it's way over 10. But my volume now is pretty far away, right? From the equivalence point. So if you were really careful when you did your titration or do a titration and you miss it by like one drop, two drop, even three drops, it doesn't really matter. You're probably volume-wise not going to be that much different from where the equivalence point is going to be. And you could do your calculations and probably still get the correct answer and stuff like that. But if you weren't careful like me, just open it up and let it halfway drain out and shut it, you know, you could be way, way far away. So that's usually why they tell you, oh, that's too dark, go do it again. Uh, but in reality, if you were really careful and really close, you know, you it wouldn't have made a very big difference in your end result of the calculations you did. I usually tell people it's more important to have volumes that are very close to each other in terms of how much you use as you do different titrations, because that usually will guarantee that you're pretty close to the equivalence point rather than the color. Because again, one drop can make it go really dark pink, even though you know you were colorless a second ago. Any questions on why now does that? There's the age old question of why that happens. So that is also what we usually see in, when you're following, say, with a pH meter, you will usually see a fairly good jump in pH to the equivalence point, and then you'll see a pretty good jump after the equivalence point in pH, again, because you have that vertical rise. Any questions on that there? Yeah. All right, so now that you learned that you wasted your time titrating all day with that, uh, let's talk about what happens now at the equivalence point here. Yeah, I'll do it here, I think. So if we are at the equivalence point, which is step three on our little graph there, uh, we will still have a reaction of our HCl uh, with our sodium hydroxide. And that will give us our sodium chloride and our H2O. So once again, using my uh, made up amount, we're starting with this in the beaker. We're adding this guy here. I'm gonna go with my four moles of HCl. Now that I'm at the equivalence point, how many moles of sodium hydroxide should I have? Should I have four, right? They should be equal to each other. 
Now, this is a really important idea to understand for this reason. A lot of times there will be problems where they will just straight up ask you, what is the pH at the equivalence point? And they will not give you a volume, right? They won't give you a volume, how much you added or anything like that. So you do need to be able to figure out, for example, how much volume you added in certain cases to reach the equivalence point. And you could do that a multitude of ways. Probably the easiest way is you could lay up a little M1V1 equals M2V2 action because you're doing a dilution. And that's why sometimes people call that the titration equation. And you could do that as long as it is a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of the moles of the acid to base. So if the acid and base are a one-to-one -one relationship, you could use M1V1 equals M2V2. If it's not, then you got to take into account the stoichiometry. The other way that you could do it, which is also pretty simple, is if you're doing a titration problem, you probably know the molarity of this guy, of the sodium hydroxide, and you know that the moles should be that number. So if you just rearrange the molarity equation and solve for moles, uh, which is, I'm sorry, solve for liters, since we're looking for liters, moles divided by molarity, you divide those two, and that will give you the volume in liters. So there's a couple different ways you could do it. By the way, if it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the acid and base and the molarity of both of those guys are the same, you'll need the exact same volume to reach the equivalence point. So they'll always be the same as you do that. So again, sometimes you do need to figure out for future calculations, you know, the volume to reach the equivalence point so you can figure out the total volume that you're at at that point. That also means I got zero here. The good news at the equivalence point is you can't really pick wrong, I hope because they're both the same number. So the change here, it's got to be four, got to be four, a little plus four action there. That's going to give me nothing there and nothing there, which is pretty much what the equivalence point means. I got four moles of this guy left over. Could convert this back to liters at this point using, once again, the total volume. Now, if you're not sure what's going on, I got this guy left. That is sodium chloride. What type of salt is that? That is a neutral salt, which means pH here should be seven, yeah? So in a strong acid, strong base titration, when you reach the equivalence point, you have pretty much only a neutral salt that's left over, which means the pH should be seven. So that's pretty easy to know. It's just going to be a pH of seven at that point. And again here, that's what we see here, pH of seven right there, dead at the, the equivalence point, yeah? Any questions on that? Really, there's not a necessarily a need for a table unless you're not sure you're at the equivalence point. You could do a table, but if you recognize that it is strong acid, strong base, and you're at the equivalence point, you should hit a pH of seven. By the way, speaking of indicator and changing color, we obviously want an indicator that changes color near the equivalence point pH, right? So you could actually see the change in color so you know to stop your titration, right? We wouldn't want, for example, for doing this titration where the pH at the equivalence point is seven, use an indicator that changes around a pH of nine, right? Because that's a little too late, right? So or at pH of 10 or something like that. Nor would we want an indicator that changes color like at a pH of two, right? Because that's too early in our titration. So when you're picking indicators to do a titration, you want to find one that is sort of closest to uh, your equivalence point pH that will actually change color that you could see it actually occur. Any questions on the equivalence point change? All right, so that then brings us to uh, here what we're looking at now after the equivalence point in sort of this fourth section. So again, even though that indicator does change color, it doesn't deter you. You're like, I'm going to keep going. And we're going to go after the equivalence point in this case and see what happens. So at the fourth part of our titration curve in this type of titration, we are after the equivalence point. So again, we're still adding our sodium hydroxide here to our HCl. We're still going to get our reaction that's going to occur here. Again, using my uh, made up for my starting here. 
and this is what I'm adding. So using my four moles of starting HCl in my beaker, the moles of sodium hydroxide at this point in the titration, since we are after the equivalence point, should it be less than, equal to, or greater than the moles of the acid I started with? What do we think? 50-50 shot. We know it's not equal, I hope, right? Because equal is at the equivalence point. So if I'm after the equivalence point, got to be more, right? Because before the equivalence point, whatever I was adding was less, right? So then you reach the equivalence point, you're equal. And then if you keep going, what you're adding is now more than what you started with, basically. So this should be more than what we started with. I'm going to go with six moles here. Again, just a made up number and zero. Now, an interesting thing happens here, since you did not stop your titration when that thing turned super dark pink, is there is actually a change that occurs. Which one is now the limiting reagent? It is the acid, yeah? This is the part where I was talking about earlier where people sometimes don't want to believe it, yes? And they want to use the bigger number. I can't use the bigger number because I'm going to get a negative number, right? You can't have negative numbers. So again, remember that when you have that conversation with you later on in here in the semester, it's going to be minus four, minus four, and plus four here. That means that at equilibrium, I basically blew through all my acid that I had. I got a little bit of two moles of this guy left over, got me four moles of that guy left over. Once again, here, after this ice table and moles, we're going to convert everybody back by using the total volume into molarity. So we're for sure in the correct units that we need. And now if we look at our ice table, we have sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide left over. Is this a buffer? Definitely not a buffer. They're not even really related to each other other than they both have a sodium in it, right? So this is definitely not a buffer. So again, that is a super common error that people make when they're doing these titrations. They see two numbers. They just learned the henderson hasselbalch equation. They use it in every calculation known to man. Remember that can only be used in a buffer situation. Yeah, so this is again, not a buffer situation. You cannot use it. We already know, hopefully from our earlier conversation that this guy is still a neutral salt, which means I am not going to be super concerned about him at all. That means really at this point, what I have left is sodium hydroxide, which is actually a strong base. So at this point, which makes sense, right? You're past your equivalence point. At this point, you're just dumping in base, right? So you're just dropping in base basically as you go past the equivalence point. That means that the molarity I have here is actually going to be my hydroxide concentration, not my H plus concentration. And because that's my hydroxide concentration, I could then calculate the pOH, right? And then I could calculate the pH. So in this type of titration, when you are past the equivalence point, you need to do one ice table. The purpose of the ice table is actually to figure out how much strong base you just dumped in there. And once you have the concentration of the strong base, you can then get the pOH and then the pH from it question on that there. So these are four distinct parts of this, by the way, specific type of titration, strong acid, strong base. Before the equivalence point, no ice table needed. It's just a strong acid. You go right into the pH equation. Before the equivalence point, you need an ice table to figure out the concentration of your strong acid you still have left over. At the equivalence point, it should be seven. Don't really need an ice table because it should be neutral. And after the equivalence point, you need one ice table to figure out the concentration of your strong base that you keep dumping in there. Any questions on there? So let's try one here. Let's just say we had, I don't know, 25 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar HCl. We want to know uh, what is the pH after... We'll go with 21 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide is added. So this is the same what we got going on. So obviously we're doing this titration. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're taking uh, 25 milliliters of HCl. 
at 0 0.1 molar. We're adding, I did 21 milliliters, I think, of sodium hydroxide, also 0 0.1 molar here. Uh, we're obviously going to get our reaction that we've been looking at, so our HCl still with our sodium hydroxide here. Going to do a little, again, sodium chloride and a little bit of water. <clears throat> Obviously, here we are starting the titration, so we do need to do this ice table in moles. So we're going to take uh, 0 0.025, which is our 25 milliliters, converted into uh, liters there. And we're going to times it by the molarity of our HCl, which is 0 0.1 moles per liter. And that's going to get us there. 0 0.0025 moles. We're going to do a similar calculation there for our sodium hydroxide, 0 0.021 times uh, 0 0.1 gives us 0 0.0021 moles. Remember, this is what we're starting with in our beaker. This is what we're adding. So the first question is, am I before or am I at or am I after the equivalence point? How would I know? If I'm at the equivalence point, the moles should be the same. They are not, right? And if I'm before the equivalence point, whatever I'm adding should be less than what I started with. And then that is where we're at, right? So we are before the equivalence point here because the moles of what I'm adding is less than what I started with, right? If I was after the equivalence point, the moles of what I'm adding would be more than what I started with. It's really important when you're doing titrations to know where you're at in the titration curve, as we'll talk about as we continue on this, this conversation, that you could actually know what type of calculation you should be doing before you even do the calculation if you actually know where you're at. So it's really important to kind of think about where you're at. Obviously, here we have zero. Because we're at before the equivalence point, our change does need to be our limiting reagent, which is in this case what we're adding, basically. So minus 0 0.0021, minus 0 0.0021, and a plus 0 0.0021. That's going to give me here 0 0.0025 minus 0 0.0021, 0 0.0004 moles, 0, 0 0.002 moles. My total volume at this point in the titration is I started with 25 milliliters. I added 21 milliliters. Uh, that is 46 milliliters without the use of a calculator, hopefully. So that we're going to divide everybody by 0 0.046 so that we convert it into liters. Again, you could divide by a thousand if you need to. Um, so we will end up with here 0004 divided by 0 0.046. Oh, going to give us uh, 0 0.008696, I'll call it. 0.02, I missed a zero there, 0 0.021 divided by 0 0.046, going to give me 0 0.04565 molar here. Molar. Once again, if you're not sure, I got sodium chloride, I got HCl, as we talked about before, this is again, not a buffer. That is a neutral salt, which means I don't really care about it. That means I really, what I have left at this point is a strong acid like we would expect because we are before the equivalence point. That means that this concentration here is actually our H plus concentration would equal 0 0.008696. That means I could go right into my pH because it is a strong acid. And if I do that there, 0 0.008696, going to give us a pH at this point in the titration of 2.06. Question on that. I can see how I did because I think this is the titration here. So 21 would be right there between uh, 1.95 and 2.2. 2.06 is in there. It's not too bad. Any questions on strong acid, strong base titration? So this titration, what we've been talking about specific to that type of titration. We're going to talk about a few other titrations uh, that are a little bit different. But specifically, that is how you handle strong acid, strong base titration. All right, we're laid up there for today.